the, the plan for today is intended to be complementary. So Carl and I are both going to be talking about after-death communications, but of different forms. So Carl will be talking particularly about after-death communications which are spontaneous and unsolicited. So they happen to people often unexpectedly, but they're quite profound and they have deep personal meaning for people. I'm going to be focusing on those occasions when people solicit a communication, typically through a sensitive person, such as a medium. And again, those experiences can be deeply profound and personal. We're extremely interested in the spontaneous lived experience that people have, and a lot of the research that we do at the University of Northampton is part of this EECS research group. So EECS is Exceptional Experiences and Consciousness Studies, and it's also the noise that you make when you visit a haunted house, uh, so that's why we've gone with that acronym. Um, and we're very interested in lived experience. Uh, for example, one of the projects that we're currently conducting is exploring um, clients' experience of sitting with a medium. We very recently commissioned um, um, a representative sample survey using a market research company called YouGov to ask a representative sample whether they'd actually visited a medium and if so, if they'd had uh, a communication from them. Surprisingly, in that survey, 21% of people claimed that they had had an experience of a medium uh, giving a communication to somebody, either as part of a public demonstration or as part of a private sitting. Uh, that translates into uh, around about 11 million people across the United Kingdom. And of those, a third, 36%, had actually themselves received a message uh, as part of that experience. That's about 4 million people, which is more than the population of Wales and Northern Ireland combined. And that's a really important figure to be aware of because very often, as we'll see tomorrow we talk about skeptics, skeptics like to um, frame paranormal experiences as something rather trivial and unusual, something that doesn't happen to very many people and is of no real consequence and not really worth researching. That is a significant number of people who've had this kind of experience. We further asked them about that experience. Did they value it? Was it useful to them? And we found that over 90%, so 92% of people said that their message was specific, 91% said that it was accurate, and 89% of them said that the information was useful to them. And so that's really important as a phenomenon that we need to understand in more detail. So we're very interested in spontaneous lived experience, but we're not really going to be talking about that today. Instead, we're going to focus on formal experimental research with mediums, which will give us a solid quantitative platform uh, from which to understand and work with people's actual experiences. Hopefully, that makes some kind of sense and is useful. So to begin with, we need a definition of mediumship that's uh, useful to circumscribe, so to describe what it is that we're going to be talking about today. And the stand a definition that um, I put together is that mediums claim to provide evidence for the survival of bodily death. And this evidence is usually in the form of physical effects, such as wraps, binds, or movements of objects that are thought to be caused by discarded spirits, or in the form of verbal communications that include information that's known only to the, the deceased person or is characteristic of them uh, when they were alive. And so this is a useful definition because it shows that there essentially there are two uh, sets of phenomena that might require different ways of investigating them and maybe will lead to different kinds of explanation. They're not mutually exclusive, so there may be physical phenomena associated with a mental medium, and a physical medium may sometimes have information that they can verbalise and provide to the client as well. But in practice, they've tended to be researched rather separately. Now, of course, um, communications with the deceased has a long history to the beginnings of recorded time. We have, for example, the Oracle at Delphi. We have uh, the Witch of Endor in the Old Testament and various other examples from uh, literature that suggest that there's been a long association between certain sensitives and people who are deceased. Uh, but the um, notion of modern spiritualism is often said to originate with the phenomena reported by the Fox sisters uh, they lived in a house with their parents in Hydesville, New York State, and in 1848 a variety of phenomena started to occur, unexpectedly um, and surprisingly, quite distressingly so, um, that were what we would call today poltergeist-like phenomena, so raps and bangs, 
that turned out to be responsive. So if you ask a particular question or invite spirit to uh, rap now, it would rap. To rap twice, it would rap twice. And they then built up a code so that enabled them to communicate with spirit. Uh, the spirit claimed to be um, the spirit of a peddler who was murdered in the house before they moved to it and gave instructions for where they might find the body buried in the cellar. Unfortunately, when they try to dig up the cellar, uh, the water table is very high in that area and the hole uh, repeatedly flooded, so we don't have any kind of resolution of that kind of psychic detective's case. Uh, we don't know whether there truly was a body in the cellar. Now, interestingly, the Fox sisters moved out of the house for a short time and lived with a relative, and the phenomena carried over with them to that new location, and their older sister, who wasn't in the house at the time of the original phenomena, recognised the business opportunity, and very soon the Fox sisters were on stage in various music halls, demonstrating their connection with spirit. Now, um, things that are rather clouded in mystery at the end of the story of the Fox sisters, certainly if you read Wikipedia, you'll see that Margareta, one of the daughters, uh, admitted to producing some of the noises fraudulently uh, through uh, the clicks of her, um, the joints in her toes, and that these could resound on floorboards and things and create noises that seem to come from different places. Uh, and she had a circuit where she demonstrated that as she gave a confessional tour. Wikipedia doesn't mention that uh, a year later she went on another tour where she recanted that confession. Uh, and the whole thing is kind of clouded in mystery by this time. Uh, she ended life as an alcoholic who was rather destitute. And any of those stories might be clouded by the fact that she needed money and, and attention. Thankfully, the story of spiritualism doesn't depend on the truth or otherwise of the Fox sisters' account. Although, I would recommend to you that you look for the E.E. E. Lewis do document, which has an investigation that took place at the time of the original Fox sisters' phenomenon. And included in that are some phenomena that are rarely mentioned, that seem to me to be impossible, even if the sisters were in cahoots and were cheating to simulate these effects. Uh, I'll leave you to follow that up if you're interested. I can give you more de details later. I'm also really happy to share with Goran a copy of the PDF of the slides. If there's anything in here that you're interested in and want to follow up, uh, I'm very happy to share that. So the most important spin-off was that people who had witnessed the phenomena that the Fox sisters produced attempted to replicate it for themselves. And private circles began to um, sprout, up, sprout up in different places around North America. And some of those circles were able to produce their own phenomena. It seemed as if deceased relatives that were recognisable to them were able to communicate through those circles. And that movement um, spread to Europe uh, and to the UK to such an extent that, for example, Queen Victoria uh, sat with a medium on at least a couple of occasions um, trying to contact her deceased husband. So th those things are fairly well documented. And then we have a phenomenon that's worthy of investigation. We have a claim about survival of bodily death, which is amenable to experimentation. We have a claimant, a sensitive, who seems to be able to generate phenomena more or less on demand and is willing to produce those phenomena in front of witnesses, for example, um, rather sceptical scientists. And in demonstrating those phenomena, give them an opportunity to speculate on how they might be produced by normal means and then experiment with the phenomenon the next time they sit with that medium. And so that's kind of the design we're going to see that uh, follows through the examples that I give you uh, from here on. So we talked about there being two essential forms of mediumship, and for a community like this, this may actually be extremely well known to you, and I apologise for going over uh, old material, but sometimes people are quite keen to identify who are the mediums who are most well respected within the scientific community, who should I focus on if I want to find out more about the phenomena that were produced and under what conditions, and the people that I would recommend that you consider, if that's the case, are for physical mediumship, D.D. Hume, so Daniel Douglas Hume, it is, that's not a typo, it is spelled H-O-M-E, but the affectation is that he always pronounced that as Hume. He was a Scottish man who emigrated as a child to America and came back to Europe when he was about 20 and was able to produce some striking phenomena, I'll, I'll mention him again in a moment, and in some ways was very influential because he, uh, people who sat with him included very eminent uh, members of society, particularly in the UK, uh, in France uh, and other European countries, 
um, and also scientists who sat with him and were impressed by the phenomena that they witnessed. And I think the Hume phenomena absolutely has been an impetus for the establishment of the British SPR in 1882. The other two uh, mediums on the physical mediumship side are Eusebia Palladino. In the literature, she's described as an Italian peasant woman who's uneducated. And she's included because she was a notorious cheat. She would certainly cheat whenever she had an opportunity. So in some of the seances that she attended, she would have a spirit cabinet in one corner. And so essentially that's just a curtain that cuts off one particular corner. And a table might be laid with various paraphernalia, such as a trumpet and some other objects. And those objects, the musical objects, might be played during the sounds, or the objects might apport. They might be relocated to another space at a time when the medium could not be responsible. Typically, in those seances, the medium would have a researcher either side of her, and they would um, hold her wrist with one hand and hold her foot down with the foot under the table. In some of these seances, however, later on when the lights were turned up, they might discover that they, the researchers were actually holding each other's hands, or they were both holding the same hand, and Pat Palladino would have had a hand free, and with an extendable rod or some other device, might have been able to produce some of the effects. Uh, there is one um, possible counter explanation of her phenomena in terms of her having an, uh, an, a, a colleague who worked with her and was helping to simulate the effects. Somebody who could secrete themselves away into the room space and then come out when the, in the darkened conditions and not be noticed. I include her on this slide because the researchers knew that she would cheat if she was given half an opportunity and as a result the conditions are extremely stringent in her case. So, for example, the kind of searches she was subjected to before the sounds began would certainly not pass an ethics committee in this day and age. So they were very clear that she wasn't able to bring materials in with her and nevertheless apportations would occur in some of those sessions. So something like the Naples sittings, for example, I would certainly recommend that you think about looking at if you're interested in physical phenomena. And then the third example is Franek Kluski, who was a Polish medium, who was particularly tested by French researchers and produce phenomena that I'll mention in a little bit more detail on another slide. So those are the three that I would, would be the starting point for an investigation of physical mediumship. And for mental mediumship, uh, the um, mediums, the claimants um, that, that I'd refer you to are particularly Mrs. Piper, Mrs. Leonard and Mrs. Garrett. Collectively, Mrs. Piper and Mrs. Leonard were researched for something in the region of 60 years, collectively, and were never uh, at any time seriously accused of cheating. Of course, uh, skeptical commentators might insinuate fraud on their part, but there's no um, persuasive evidence that, that, that any fraud took place. Mrs. Piper is described, uh, well actually I say more about Mrs. Piper in a minute, so I'll save her until then. Uh, Mrs. Leonard uh, particularly was active uh, between the wars. Uh, she produced some of the phenomena for Oliver Lodge which certainly influenced his views about the possibility of survival. And she was involved in something called the Cross Correspondences, which were quite an important stage in psychical research. Uh, and Mrs. Garrett, who was an Irish woman who emigrated to the United States, uh, she was very um, judicious in her choice of partners, her marriage partners, and she became quite wealthy. And interestingly, much of her wealth was ploughed back into the investigation of psychical phenomena. Uh, so she... Um, Gay awarded grants to various researchers to uh, pursue their own projects, for some of which she would be a participant, but certainly not for all of them. And she established an organisation, the Parapsychology Foundation, that still exists today for the study of and education about psychical phenomena, uh, which is an interesting strategy. She is somebody who certainly uh, represents um, the dilemma that some mediums face in never being truly sure whether the communication she received did come from a spirit world, or were actually the product of her own unconscious. And she regularly oscillated between those two positions. Uh, I think towards a later life, she actually preferred the notion that these may be uh, some, some unconscious process at work. They're very much worth investigating. <clears throat> As a scientist, I kind of alluded to this before, the approach we would want to take is to observe the phenomena in situ, how do these phenomena naturally occur and express themselves, and then think creatively about how we might simulate those phenomena by normal means. 
And then that allows us a sense of what we might need to introduce to the research environment in order to rule out those normal explanations, to progress things. The, the problem with spontaneous cases is people describe their experience and we can neither rule in or rule out the competing different explanations because we weren't there and we don't have access to all of the available facts. But if we're conducting um, field experiments, we can speculate about what we think might have happened then and we, then we can apply those speculations to a future uh, sitting, so our future experiments of that sort. And with uh, physical mediumship, the standard explanation is in terms of misperception and, um, and, and suggestion. So the idea might be that particularly under the uh, degraded conditions of a typical physical seance from this time, where the medium is operating either under red light or more often under darkened conditions where it's extremely difficult to see anything that's going on around you. Some of the object, objects might be painted with luminous paint so you, you can see where they might be in space. But on the whole, you can see very little of what's going on. And in those situations where our, our sensory information is degraded, we may be more susceptible to suggestion. So if somebody says, for example, I think the temperature in the room has gone down by a couple of degrees, I'm certainly feeling much colder, it's very easy for us to actually start to think, hold on a minute, I think I'm feeling that too, I'm also feeling a little bit colder, even though objectively the temperature in that room hasn't changed at all. So those are quite powerful things. Uh, they're not especially new, so Richard Hodgson, one of the researchers of the SPR, um, conducted experiments on this phenomenon in about 1900, 1910 and showed that actually people are extremely unreliable witnesses, that they actually misremember things that happened, they forget whole chunks of the, uh, of the narrative, um, and they don't um, notice or don't remember elements which are crucial if you want to work out how something might have been achieved fraudulently, and it really undermines the quality of human testimony in these situations. A modern day version of the same has been conducted by Richard Wiseman at the University of Hertfordshire, uh, you can see an example of that. We don't quite have time today to share the video, but on YouTube, if you uh, just put in something like Wiseman and Sounds, uh, you will get access to these clips of a documentary that was produced at the time he was conducting these experiments. Uh, and so it kind of illustrates the standard technique. And it's very clear that under these circumstances, people can be led to perceive things that are not truly going on. Now, we've conducted research at Northampton that shows that it works both ways that actually, if you're a sceptical person and you witness a, a demonstration of something paranormal, you will misperceive and misremember the uh, events that you witness in a way that allows you to continue to be sceptical of them. You misperceive things that say, ah yeah, they did this thing that was rather dubious or a hand disappeared from camera view and that must have been the point in time when they bent a spoon or they brought an object uh, to the table. And, and those things didn't really happen. So we're all very poor observers. And that's what we learned from it. But of course, we can build that into our designs. We can take precautions that mean that we're not relying solely on eyewitness testimony and that we have other ways of measuring and gauging the phenomenon that might take place. One thing we can also do before we get to that, actually, is we might be able to generate artifacts in the situation or have phenomena occur that would be impossible to achieve even if we were blindfolded and wearing earplugs and were completely oblivious to the surroundings. If we allowed the medium, the fraudulent medium, to do whatever they want, there are some phenomena that would still be impossible to achieve by normal means. Two examples of that, so go back to Dee Dee Hume. Um, so we imagine table levitations in these classic seances where people sit around a table and typically our hands are placed palms on the top of the table and perhaps our fingers are touching and maybe touching the fingers of the people around us mm -hmm. and at some point the energy builds in the space and the table starts to make tremors and maybe tilts a little bit and some people might even report that the table starts to levitate. Mm -hmm. Well for some of Dee Dee Hume's sittings with eminent scientists we're talking about great oak Victorian tables that would take three or four workmen, three or four labourers, each at a corner to lift if it's possible to lift in the way that people describe. And nevertheless, in some of those uh, sittings, the table has levitated so much that people have had to rise out of their seats in order to make contact with the top of the table. That, to me, clearly requires a different kind of explanation besides misperception and suggestion for that to occur.
One other explanation which we're not going to spend any time on is the idea of group hypnosis, that everybody is deluded into believing uh, something that's been suggested to them. Uh, people are very different in how susceptible they are to being hypnotised and there's absolutely no guarantee that you can get a collection of people together who will all succumb to that particular suggestion. That doesn't seem realistic to me. The other impossible phenomenon uh, relates to Franek Klusky, who's in the top picture. Uh, and he, uh, on some occasions, as he sat with uh, the scientific community in Paris, uh, produced um, wax moulds that were produced by the apparitions that appeared in the space. So Klusky generated uh, ectoplasm that ectoplasm would morph its shape until it represented the image of somebody that would be recognised by one of the sitters. So it might be the face of a daughter who died in childhood, or it might be a relative who, who was maybe a little bit older. And these were tangible phenomena. So, for example, there might be the uh, materialisation of a hand, and that hand would touch the hand of one of the sitters, and that sitter would report that this felt like a warm flesh and blood hand, uh, a real physical hand, not just something kind of wafty and kind of uh, tissue -y. Um, so these phenomena are quite striking when they occurred, but again, at that, that time, they're still subjective and they rely on eyewitness testimony. The researchers working with Klusky um, arranged to have some warm melted wax in the space that they were working in, and the materialised personalities were invited to place uh, their hands and sometimes their feet into that wax, that melted wax, to withdraw their hand, allow the wax to cool and harden, and then when they dematerialized, they would leave behind the mold that they had created. Some of those molds are still available, and here's Mario Varvoglis of IMI, based in Paris, showing some of the examples that they have in their collection. And what's really interesting and challenging about these is the nature of the position of the limbs, uh, the, the position they were in when the molds were created. And you can see that perhaps some wax hands, if we had a wax hand like that, and then if a person wanted to simulate it, you could put your hand in the wax, remove your hand, and maybe perhaps very delicately, when the wax has cooled, you might be able to withdraw your actual hand and leave the mould behind. But it's almost impossible to imagine how these moulds would be produced without cracking the wax if you're using a physical hand to create them. So I find it very challenging and very interesting. Uh, but they're very much in the minority. They're interesting because uh, there are very few instances of these kinds of impossible things from these sittings. Bringing things forward to the kind of tail end of the 20th, 20th century and now into the 21st century, there are two cases of physical mediumship that have been investigated to a degree uh, over the last 20 years or so. The first of these is the skull experiment. That's the one that features on the left. The book that's illustrated there is a popular book on the phenomena. Uh, Skoll is actually the name of a village in Norfolk in the United Kingdom, although the phenomena also occurred, uh, at a, I think it was in Spain, they also have a place. Uh, and these are the researchers who investigated uh, the Skoll phenomena. So we have a circle that sits regularly in order to uh, work towards physical phenomena, and over time they're able to build the energy of that circle, and they're also able to build rapport with the spirit world, with their particular communicators, to such a point that physical phenomena start to occur. And, and this takes kind of um, dedication and time and patience uh, typically for these things to appear, to occur. And over time, as that relationship builds, they feel able to invite strangers in to sit with that circle and to, to experience the phenomena. And at that stage, uh, council members of the Society for Psychical Research, and we have here Monty Keane, uh, Montague Ullman, and we have David Fontana, they sat with the Skull Circle at various times and they wrote a collective report to describe their uh, experiences and they were very impressed by the phenomena that they saw. And again, it included things like um, uh, music from objects at times when people weren't close to the, the, the instruments to be able to play them, apportations of objects, light phenomena, in particular light beads that might even pass through the body, um, and, and, so, and particularly photographic phenomena. So they had unexposed camera films and then later on when those films were processed, they had all sorts of rather ornate images uh, that were on them. In that same book, <coughs> there are also some sceptical commentaries by people like Alan Gold and Tony Cornell, which are very dubious about the nature of the phenomena as reported. And unfortunately, as somebody who never sat with that circle and doesn't have direct experience, 
I have to side with the skeptics in this case because the conditions under which the phenomena occurred are not satisfactory. They wouldn't have passed muster um, in relation to what were the SPR was doing 100 years previously. Uh, so it wasn't standard, for example, for the researchers to be uh, located at either side of the mediums so that they could have control over their limbs in these uh, sessions. There was an aversion to using red light and there may be good fundamental reasons why the spirit world cannot act under red light and with infrared cameras operating, but we could use things like heat cameras these days that would still allow us to build a level of check or balance that would give us a more definitive sense of whether the phenomena uh, could be produced by normal means and those things were not in place. I think as a community, parapsychologists have been underwhelmed by the phenomena from the skull case because we can't effectively rule out normal explanations in that case. The second case is Kaimuga and the Felix group. Uh, the phenomena here are mainly produced in Germany and in Austria and they have been investigated by parapsychologists in particular, we have Michael Nahm on the right here, a German researcher, and Steve Browdy, uh, an American philosopher. Browdy in particular was very impressed by the phenomena he witnessed at first. Ultimately, both have concluded rather negatively that they believe that the phenomena had been produced fraudulently. Again, this isn't the case that I've investigated personally, so I don't have a strong opinion and I'm not going to uh, offer one now. But I would recommend that you read uh, accounts for yourself and make your own decision about the strength of this case. Um, and this is the, the first of two uh, plugs to the Psy Encyclopedia. So the SPR in the UK has invested quite a lot of time and resources in producing uh, an online resource to compete with the, the rather pernicious misinformation that you can get from Wikipedia. So if you type in a term like poltergeist at the moment into Google, the first return will be the Wikipedia entry on poltergeistery, and it will be full of information to say that this is always fraudulent, that there have never been any uh, strong cases that are difficult to explain in normal terms, and we know as researchers that that simply is simplistic and untrue. So the Sci Encyclopedia is intended to be an antidote to that. It doesn't necessarily mean that it adopts a proponent view, but rather it attempts to offer a balanced and evidence-based perspective on the phenomena that it considers and it's concerned with psychical research and parapsychology. So I, I strongly recommend it to you. When I speak to uh, my medium colleagues and we collaborate together on various projects, they bemoan uh, the, the lack of physical circles and of strong physical mediums in the community that they work with. And they, as, as many of my generation do, they blame the younger generation for that. That young people these days just don't have the time or the patience to devote to working in circle to build up that rapport of that community and that's why we're not seeing the phenomenon today. So it's, it's an ephemeral society we live in, everything's online, it's immediate and it's very short um, and that's not conducive to producing a strong physical circle. And of course other physical circles may be very protective of what they do and understandably be dubious about the motives of researchers who want to participate and maybe for that reason there are some strong circles out there but they, they wouldn't be willing to invite us in to attend and observe. So that's kind of where we are with physical mediumship. I think the um, situation is a little bit stronger when it comes to mental mediumship. Again, we need to begin by observing the in situ phenomena and then see how we might explain those phenomena. So in this case, remember, in mental mediumship, the evidence is in terms of the particulars of the information that you're provided with, that you as the recipient of the message believe that this is information that's known only to the, the deceased personality and to you. Perhaps reminiscing about an incident in your childhood when you knew each other and something happened. The kind of thing that you've never actually talked to anybody about and you certainly haven't documented in any way. And nevertheless, through the medium, this entity is, is talking to you about that and chuckling about that event or incident. The standard sceptical explanation for impressive mental mediumship demonstrations is in terms of a technique called cold reading. In fact, when you look at cold reading, it comprises a set of different techniques, very different from one another, that might be classed into two categories. You have what are called passive methods and you have active methods. Uh, and these are well documented, not only in psychology, but in particular in the magic literature. So within uh, magic, there is a sub-discipline called mentalism, and that includes people who want to develop as 
uh, someone who simulates psychic effects. Some of those people identify as pseudo-psychics. So they um, apply their words, they, they work professionally as if they were a medium or a psychic, but in fact they're using these psychological techniques. And there's a set of booklets and pamphlets that are only available to magicians that go under names like Money Making Cold Reading and King of the Cold Readers. Uh, fortunately, uh, we've got that library of material and we've used those to inform two descriptions of cold reading that we've published. Again, if you're interested in it, do get in touch. I'll give my email details at the end. Very happy to share those chapters with you. So the passive methods rely on the notion that people believe that they're more unique than they truly are, that we all have much more in common than we believe, and that um, when a, a medium or a psychic says with something uh, that's generally true, we misinterpret that and think that it's more true of us than it would be for other people. So um, that might be in terms of things like, that are called Barnum effects, named after P.T. Barnum. So you might say that very often you, you appear much more confident than you really are. You actually suffer from the imposter syndrome. You don't really have as much confidence in yourself as maybe others might think, but you're able to fake it until you make it, that kind of idea. Um, and of course, that's probably true of everybody. Um, to, to a greater or lesser degree, but we maybe don't notice it so much in other people. And these Barnum statements have been used since uh, Bertrand Forer first described them in 1949 in personality uh, and the psychometric circles. They've been used a lot and they work. They're very effective. You give them to people, they say, yes, that is true of me and it's more true of me than it is of other people in my judgment. So that they're very effective. Others are kind of trivial statements um, that we don't realise are true for many people. Sue Blackmore did some interesting work on this, asking people, for example, if they had a copy of Vivaldi's uh, Four Seasons at home, if they had a scar on their left knee, if there's an incident from their childhood that even now, if they think about it, it gives them a day blush and embarrassment. Again, the kind of things that actually turn out to be um, statistically quite common, they're not true of everybody, but common enough that if you throw enough of those darts, quite a few are going to hit the target and people are going to think that's interesting and that's true. And then generalizations, which are statements that are throwaway, but if they're effective, if they're true of you, you'll remember them. And if they're untrue of you, you'll tend to forget them when you're, you receive a barrage of statements over the course of a reading, so 30 minutes or 40 minutes perhaps. Uh, so examples of this might be someone in, with a blue car is going to come into your life and it's going to have an influence on the direction that your life takes. Blue is quite a popular colour for cars. And if you meet somebody for whom that happens to be true, you may actually pay more attention to the things that they say to you, and you may actually act on them in a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Or someone in uniform, somebody who, who um, has a uniform, they're going to come into your life. Well, what counts as a uniform? Are we talking about the armed services? Is it a police officer? Could it be somebody who works in a supermarket and actually still has to wear a uniform each day? So something that maybe seems quite specific may turn out in practice to have many ways in which it can be fulfilled. And with the active dynamic methods, they rely on interaction with the client. And so some of those use what's called true cold reading, where I read your behavior, your non-verbal behavior, and that tells me whether you can accept the information I'm giving you, whether that's true or you like what you hear, or whether I need to deviate and go to another topic. And it relies on the normal way in which a dyadic conversation takes place. So in a normal conversation between two people, one person is doing the speaking and one person is doing the listening. And the person doing the speaking every now and again will take a breath. And you might notice that normally in conversation they don't look in you in the eyes unless you're in a romantic relationship. Normally they're looking everywhere but not always at you and as a listener you're almost always looking at them. When they get to a gap, when they take a breath, they will be looking at you then because they're watching for signals that you give as to whether you want them to continue talking. So you would nod and you would smile. You maintain eye contact at that time, you don't look away. If you take a breath at that point, it's a very powerful signal and they'll stop talking even if it's mid-sentence because people don't necessarily take breaths in the middle of a sentence like I did then. It can occur anywhere, but that is the point when they're looking at you. Now the exception to that is a lecture. So certainly with our undergraduates, when I talk about cold reading to them, I know very well that if I happen to look at somebody when I'm taking a breath, they will absolutely be horrified and look away as quickly as possible, and we constantly get negative back channel signals during a lecture. I hope it's not just me, that everybody experiences this, but that tends to be the pattern that that works. And that can be really useful to a pseudo-psychic 
because that information uh, tells you whether the things you're saying are a good fit or not and you can use it in a very uh, powerful way. So you might, for example, say, okay, I'm looking, in, in one case, I'm looking at this tarot card and this usually relates to a younger member of the family. That's like a son or a daughter, a nephew or a niece. But in fact, I'm looking at you carefully to see if you respond to any of those so that I know that you have a son or a daughter, a nephew or a niece. And I pack that away and a little bit later on in relation perhaps to another card, I might then say, oh, and this one is related to your son as if I knew that all along and that's coming from my other source. So that's how that kind of a cold reading technique would work. And then hot reading would involve gathering information in advance, very, in a very overt way. Uh, and in the past, this would be along the lines that, that um, regular private detectives might do. So I've got one booklet, for example, which describes 50 pieces of information you might be able to glean from a check. So if somebody paid for a session in advance with a check, um, there's various bits of information you might be able to pick up from that uh, um, that, that you could feed into the situation later on. These days, the situation is much worse because of the internet and social media, people leak so much information about themselves that they're unaware of that's very easy to feed back. Obvious things like you get a new pet and so you put a Facebook, well, of my generation, perhaps our generation, you put a Facebook announcement about your pet the kids don't do that anymore. Uh, but there'll be some other way, Instagram or something, where you, you announce that and some of the stuff that still in, leaves a footprint. Uh, you might have a photo taken with somebody you're very close to and celebrate their birthday. And so that then would tell me this is a significant date for you. I'll feed that back in later on as part of the reading and so on. Uh, we, we might have photos that happen to have our home in the background and it's possible to get the address from that. There's all sorts of information that's out there that these days could be fed in to those readings. So those are the techniques, and again, it leaves us in a situation where with a spontaneous instance, where somebody sat with a medium and said it was amazing, they gave me these pieces of information, and I have no idea how they did it, this could be a potential normal explanation. Okay. We need to then incorporate that knowledge into the designs we use to formally test mediums, to see if they can produce information that goes beyond what we might expect from cold reading. Okay, oh, that she's in the wrong place, really. So the white chrome is Pine. She very much fits with that model, for example. So I mention her because the first figure here is William James. He's the founder of modern psychology. Uh, he still features in top 50 and top 100 most influential psychologists of all time. He's still extremely highly respected. Uh, he had a very influential career in mainstream psychology, including the psychology of religion but he was also a very key mover in the area of spiritualism and psychical research. He became aware of Mrs. Piper through his mother-in-law and his wife, who went to sit with this medium who was building a little bit of a reputation. Um, they were so impressed by the sittings that they had with her that they invited him to come along. He in turn was so impressed that he named her his white crow. And this is, if you want to demonstrate that not all crows are black, you don't need to show that no crows are black, you only need one exception to that rule. And his exception, his singular case, is Mrs. Piper. Um, the second figure is Richard Hodgson, who I mentioned before in terms of um, being a very skeptical person who was interested in misperception and suggestion. Uh, Richard Hodgson was involved in the investigation of Mrs. Piper. So uh, William James is American, uh, Mrs. Piper is American. Those tests took place in the States, but she was invited uh, at the SPR's expense to give some demonstrations in the United Kingdom, up in Liverpool and down in London, for example. And during that time, she was being continuously monitored. So um, the SPR members are from a, a kind of elite stratum of society. So for example, they allocated her a maid to, to watch after her needs that came from their households. Uh, and they knew in that way then that she couldn't then be gleaning information uh, surreptitiously in that way. Richard Hodgson employed a private detective to follow Mrs. Piper around in the daytimes when she was free to see if she would um, engage in any suspicious activity, seemed to be involved in any kind of networks that might provide her with information about sitters, and there was no evidence whatsoever of that. A particularly, uh, I think, impressive uh, series of trials involved one of her spirit controls. So I'm sure you know, mediums very often have a person in spirit who they have a particular bond and rapport with, who can act as a mediator, the equivalent of a medium, but in the spirit world. And one of uh, Mrs. Piper's spirit controls was GP. GP in life 
reported being a person that was known to some of the SPR members, but in a peripheral way, he was an associate rather than a close friend. Um, and GP, the control, through Mrs. Piper, sat 30 times uh, with people that were known to the living GP. He recognised 29 of those 30 people and responded to them as the living GP would have done. So somebody that he knew in a position of authority, for example, maybe the father of a friend, he would be extremely respectful in the kind of language that he used. If it was an old university body, the language would be very different from that. And in 29 of the 30 cases, it matched exactly as you would expect with the living GP. And the one exception was a woman that he knew when she was a young girl, and clearly she'd physically changed quite a lot since then, and, and she wasn't recognised by GP in that particular sitting where she was the sitter. So again, that, that's a really interesting case, I think. And we can see from that instance that it's very difficult to see how a cold reading model or explanation might apply given uh, the, the elements of that situation. No opportunity to gather information in advance, to respond to people in ways that seem to go beyond simple platitudes that might apply to anybody, because you're responding differently depending on the sitter and their relationship to GP. So this seems to me to be quite a strong uh, case. In terms of modern control tests, and really we're looking only at the 21st century now, um, although some of these will be the late 90s actually, I don't think they feature maybe in one of those uh, reviews we'll mention in a minute. I'm going to talk particularly about um, Trish Robertson, she's on the right, and Professor Archie Roy, he's an astronomer, or he was at uh, the University of Glasgow. And they designed a, a series of trials, a series of experiments that they call the PRISM experiment, and it's uh, psychical research involving selected mediums. They've worked for a long time with the medium community and have built up a, a degree of rapport and trust. And these people were willing to be tested by them, knowing that it would be a fair test. Some of the mediums they work with, although they're not named in the papers, are extremely well-known, popular mediums uh, who have a very good track record. So we have the medium here on platform, so they're on a stage, and there's a series of chairs set out. And the first thing we want to do is introduce a barrier, a physical barrier, that prevents the medium from being able to see and potentially hear the audience members. So straight away we've cut out any opportunity for um, true cold reading, um, so watching the behaviour of the people in the audience, maybe getting a sense that I think this is going to be the person who's uh, the intended recipient of this message, and I'm going to watch them to see how they react. There's no possibility for that kind of uh, communication. Then we invite a bunch of people to come in to be prospective clients. They're all coloured differently to reflect the fact that they have different life histories and they know different people in spirit, people who have different occupations, died in different ways, those kind of things, the kind of indicators that a medium will give you that they're in touch with your loved one. Those are the kind of topics that they would focus on and their personalities as well. And then crucially, we use a truly random method of some sort to identify who on this particular occasion will be the intended recipient of the message. Okay. So in that way, we can't set this thing up in advance. There's no way in advance that anybody could know who will be the recipient for this trial. And then the medium on platform will uh, call out to spirit, the spirit world and see if there's anybody in the spirit world who knows the person that's been identified, who's sitting in chair 17, and has a message that they would like to convey to them. On many trials that was possible, obviously the mediums knew what the uh, trial would comprise, they knew what the conditions would be and were happy to operate to work under those conditions. Um, and so then they give a series of statements, ostensibly from somebody in the spirit world, and everybody in the audience is checking those against their own experience. So we've got somebody here, she, she's quite a short woman, she used to be taller, but as she got older she's kind of shrunk a little bit, uh, she's got her hair tied back in a bun, uh, she's wearing uh, some kind of a coloured uh, shawl, let's say. And the intended recipient is checking through this. Well, that sounds like my Auntie Mary. Uh, that sounds really interesting. Yes, I can take that, as one might do if you're in a congregation at a spiritual service. Yes, I can take that. That makes sense to me. So is everybody else. They're acting as baseline people, and they're seeing whether the statements might apply generally to lots of people. And in that way, we can see whether we go beyond what we might expect by chance. Does the audience, the people in the audience, know the number 17 guys or not? That's a genius question. <laughs> if only I had a slide to answer that exact question, and I shall. 
So yes, on these trials, everybody in the audience knows that it's the person in chair 17 who's the intended recipient of the message. And there are psychological consequences. So firstly, the person in chair 17 is thinking, oh my goodness, you know, the attention of the room is on me. I don't want to mess up this experiment. I'll try harder cognitively to make sense of this message if I possibly can. As in a real demonstration, as a part of a service, it's really quite embarrassing to say, no, I can't take that. I can't make any sense of it. You see that very often, in maybe in the middle of a communication, it starts quite strongly, we've got a real connection here, and then it goes slightly sideways. And you can, you can sense the, the embarrassment of the person who is not able to say, yes, that also makes sense to me. They struggle and struggle to try and make sense of it. And everybody else here knows that they're not the intended recipient. So they're kind of relaxed, metaphorically, thinking, okay, well, interestingly, yeah, that does fit with me, but I don't need to worry too much because it's not that important. So fiendishly, in these experiments, there were some trials on which the audience was misinformed as to who the intended recipient was. So on this particular trial, everybody thinks this person is the intended recipient. So they're the one that's sitting upright and working really hard to make sense of the message. Everybody else is, breath is breathing a sigh of relief, including the person in chair 17. They don't think they're the intended recipient. But in the actual trial, they still are, and the medium is calling out to the spirit world for the person in chair 17. What do we find? Well, we find that the person who thinks they're the recipient, when they rate the statements, they rate them as significantly more accurate than the baseline people do. So there's strong evidence that there really is a motivation effect. But the person who's the actual recipient, even though they don't think that they are, they give higher ratings still, and they're significantly more accurate. So there are some experimental trials that effectively rule out cold reading that still provide evidence that the information is more accurate for the intended recipient than it, we would expect by chance. So uh, appropriately, these statistics are astronomically significant since Archie Rory was an astronomer. Uh, the effect sizes from some other trials are slightly less so, but these are maybe more robust experimental trials. I'll not uh, labour the point, so I won't go through this slide, but I will mention that Julie Beischel has her own website for the Winbridge Institute, and that includes videos of her being interviewed by various parties, where she explains their methodology in a lot more detail than I have time for here. Uh, and again, in her studies, she is finding that the intended recipients are giving significantly higher ratings than are people who are the decoys or the control people in those trials. So there's a bit of a database that's building up here. Uh, I'm rushing through this because I want to save 10 minutes to look at some other stuff, but yes? Sir. In, in the, the earlier experiment, how was it communicated to the medium that selected person? I didn't get that. Yes, so, so it would be effective what used to be called a chair test. So it would literally be, we randomly run this, it is, it is the person in chair 17. Okay. But the medium would not even necessarily know how the, num the chairs have been numbered. So they wouldn't necessarily know it's the person on the left and the third row. Okay. But, but that's fair. that was standard actually for the SPR. They also run chair tests of a different sort. Okay. So individual experiments can only tell part of the story. And it's very easy to cherry pick maybe the best evidence and overstate the case for mediumship from experimental work. There are certainly failures to replicate this effect. The most obvious example of that would be Kieran O'Keefe working in the UK, his experiments in one of them, the mediums were actually significantly worse than chance. Uh, so the baseline um, readings were given higher ratings than were the mediums readings in his experiments. So instead what we do is we uh, look at the combined picture, the cumulative picture, using a method called meta-analysis. And meta-analysis allows us to take the effects from various individual studies and add them together to see if cumulatively there is an overall effect from these experiments. And there have been two examples of meta-analysis with mediumship. The first of them by Saraf and colleagues, uh, again for the 21st century. Only 14 experiments, but we're a small research community and very few people are doing this kind of work. Um, and across those, the overall effect size is quite small. So an effect size of zero means there's no effect. It means that the um, intended reading gets about the same kind of rating as the decoy reading. If you had a negative effect size, as in the Kieran O'Keefe study, it would mean the decoy reading is actually rated as more accurate. 
So a positive effect size means that people are rating, on average, the intended reading higher than the baseline, the, the decoy reading. Uh, and across the whole set of studies, that's what we're finding. When we look at the individual studies, we get a lovely little plot. It's maybe a bit difficult to unpack. This is called a forest plot. Uh, when, when they work really nicely, it can look a little bit like a tree. And the dots, the square boxes that you can see here, they are the effect size from those individual studies. The dotted line is zero, so that means nothing um, happened at all. And where the box is to the left of that dotted line, it means in that study, the decoy reading was rated as higher than the medium's reading, the, the intended reading. So they've gone against our expectation. And where it's on the right, it means it has gone the way we might expect if mediumship were possible. And some of the studies are shifted more to the right than others, so they produce a stronger effect. So the important thing for us is that overall, collectively, there is a positive effect, and it's highly significant. So uh, you would see this in one time in a thousand million, uh, this, this extreme result of this cumul cumulative effect size. Now, and so they conclude the results of this meta-analysis support the hypothesis that some mediums can retrieve information about the seas per persons. So that's a very typical kind of rather low-key kind of conclusion that you'd see in a scientific report. Adam Brock and some of his colleagues have an alternative meta-analysis. Ironically, they have a big effect size. It's 0.22 in their case instead of 0.18. But their study is not significant because they have fewer studies and it doesn't deviate enough from chance to give us significance for, for technical reasons. But I wanted to mention that as well because there are two meta-analyses and, and they don't quite agree. But they, they left out some studies, and as a result, the effect size went up a little bit, but there are many fewer trials, and so it wasn't as powerful a test. Okay. The next step at the moment is to look at process, and I just wanted to mention briefly, um, EEG studies of mediumship as one approach that can be taken, uh, and this has been really useful. So in this study, they're very interested in knowing what's going on neurologically with mediums when they bring spirit forward, and when they're trying to... Uh, give information to the sitter or client. And two things that they did that were really important. So one was they compared uh, the brain activity of the medium on occasions when they are sitting with spirit against occasions when instead of actually encountering somebody who is deceased, they imagined somebody that they knew to have died and they went through that same process that they might do in giving evidential information. So they describe how the person looks physically, they might describe that person's personality in their head, and they might um, reflect on the way in which that person passed, um, and, and things they might be interested in uh, about the living people who were with us. And they also looked at what happened when you created an imaginary person, somebody who had never existed, and also recollecting somebody that you actually did know had lived and died, uh, but you're not in contact with them uh, mediumistically. And they found that the EEG in those different situations was dramatically different. And this is really useful in arguing against the idea that a medium who believes that they're bringing spirit forward and has a spirit connection The final thing I wanted to talk about is another feature which I think is really important. And that is that as a client, we may still be left rather cold if all we're getting is information that we already knew uh, that, seems to, that is factually true, but doesn't have any quality of the individual that it's supposed to be coming from. And I think this is best captured firstly through Steve Browdy and then by Alan Gold. So Steve Browdy in a book that I would highly recommend, Immortal Remains, uh, that looks at mediumship evidence from a philosopher's perspective, he says that absolutely, based on the record to date, we can rule out normal processes such as fraud or misreporting, malobservation and cryptomnesia, where we're, um, information that we've learned previously and forgotten that we've learned bubbles through to consciousness later on, and we think it comes from a psychic source. But we can't rule out super psi. We can't rule out the possibility that the medium is simply psychic and picking up either telepathically or through clairvoyance, the information that they're providing to you. We therefore can't be sure that this information is evidence in support of the continued existence of that personality. It could just be psychic. 
rather than mediumistic. Okay, how do we deal with that? Well, I think the way we can access something that is better evidence uh, of survival is following Alan Gold. And he says, beyond the actual information, we need evidence of intelligence and of personality characteristics. The communication has to reflect the goals and purposes and affections, as well as a stream of memory, of the person that it claims to be. So for the last bit, I want to give you some examples of how we might see examples that go beyond something that could be explained in terms of super sight. So the first example uh, we published in the SPR journal some years ago, and this involves a chess match that took place between um, Victor Korchnoi, who as a previous world champion and still at that time was working as somebody of grandmaster level, and a deceased chess player who communicated their moves uh, through a medium. So um, I forget which it was, Eisenbeiss or Hassler, but one of them had a long-standing interest in chess. He knew the medium, Robert Rollins, and he asked Rollins if it might be possible to call out to the spirit world and see if there was anybody in the spirit world who had played chess to a high level who would be willing to come through and play a chess match. And surprisingly, um, we, we got um, Gay Zamorowski came through, who was somebody who's well known, there are lots of records of him being active in the kind of 1890s, 1900s, that kind of a period, at a time when chess used to be an activity where tournaments would take place in different cities around uh, Europe and the community of people would move from place to place uh, to play those tournaments, rather like a, the, the professional tennis association, that kind of thing. And in this particular game, he managed to recruit Korchnoi to play against uh, Geza Morotsky in spirit. And ultimately, Korchnoi won, but it took him to move 48 before he won that match. And reflecting on the quality of the match, Korchnoi said, well, during the opening phase, Morotsky showed weakness. His play is old-fashioned, but I must confess that my last moves haven't been too convincing, and I'm not sure that I'll win. He has compensated the fault of the opening by a strong end game. In the end game, the ability of a player shows up, and my opponent plays very well. In life, Morotsky was known for relatively weak opening play, but for a strong middle part of the game and a strong end game. So at that level, it matches up. Perhaps more importantly, Vernon Neppi, who is a polymath, he's a neuroscientist, a psychotherapist, but he's also a chess master and interested in parapsychology. He actually formally analyzed the chess match, all the moves were known, and he analyzed it in two ways, from his own subjective perspective as a chess master, but also using a computer in about this period, so 2007, to analyze the various moves. And based on it, he concluded, Morotsky played at master or very disputably low rusty grandmaster level. And this was possibly equivalent to his standard of play while alive. The winner, Korchnoi, played at a level of an accomplished grandmaster. Because of major stylistic differences, in his belief, a chess computer could not have simulated the game and nor could many living chess players. And it's important to stress that they're reporting on a game that took place quite a few years before 2006, at a time when we didn't have the internet and chess computers were not as sophisticated as they are today in terms of simulating the style of certain people. So this poses a challenge to SuperSci because it's not a matter of factual information but rather a mode of expression. Your personality plays out through the way in which you play chess and so in that sense it's much more nuanced and difficult to uh, replicate. The other example is a motivated communication that I recommend to you again. This is published in the SPR journal and it reflects a situation in which sadly, tragically, a woman was murdered in her own flat in London uh, and people in that community were rather shocked by that death. And in that community, so um, she lived about three miles away, Christine Holland, but she didn't know Jackie Poole who'd been murdered, but she heard of the murder and she felt that her, her space was being possessed, there was somebody there. She was training, she was developing as a medium, and so she reached out and asked if, if that was Jackie for some reason, and received the affirmative. And there was a communication, so Jackie Poole apparently communicated circumstances of her death, including who the killer was to her. So Christine was so agitated by this that she notified the police and the police were obliged to follow up on all leads at that stage, no matter how ridiculous we might think them. And so two police officers turned up at her house and they took a statement from her. And this is the literal one of the pages from the notebook of that original statement. 
In total, she made 131 statements that were potentially testable, and of those, 120 were verified as being true. One of the officers, it turned out, had been at the crime scene. Specific names that she gave uh, included three names of people who left answer phone messages on uh, Jackie's phone after she'd been murdered, uh, that were on the phone by the time the officers attended. Um, and this is really interesting, this kind of a case. She, they uh, ostensibly, the medium identified who the murderer was, somebody who went by a nickname, Pokey, uh, and they knew who that person was, that they discovered who that person was. And that person wasn't prosecuted because there wasn't sufficient evidence, but this was enough for them to actually re uh, retain some material evidence from Pokey, particularly a jumper. And some years later, after some advances in DNA technology, that jumper was reanalyzed and was able to provide evidence to position him at the crime scene and to have had contact uh, with uh, Jackie and he was sent to prison for the murder. So why this is really interesting again to me is the idea it's not just a series of uh, elements of factual information but rather clearly the person who benefits most from the conveyance of this information is the deceased Jackie Poole. I mean she, she went by the name Jackie Hunter to begin with because that was her uh, maiden name. In this case. So, so that's a stronger case, I think. And there are other motivated cases that I mentioned to you briefly, if you want to follow up. And this is part of my shameless plug for the Psy Encyclopedia, that there are entries on each of these cases that you might want to follow up. So in particular, there are two very strong cases where this, the information seems to be motivated, that only makes sense in terms of the, uh, the desires and drives of the supposed intelligent agent. And this is the Copenhagen fire, um, that it involved um, Jon Jonsson, who was the, the uh, entity that came through originally and described a case, uh, a fire that was happening. It, it was later Emil, uh, I can't remember, Emil's second name now, Jensen. Emil Jensen. And the, the supposed um, communicating entity described a fire that was literally taking place at that time in Copenhagen. And it was of interest to him because in life he had literally lived only two doors away from the warehouse that was set on fire. Um, that's worth following. I mentioned Hafstein Bjornsson because one of his most famous cases is a drop-in communicator who went by the name of Runke and he wanted his leg to be discovered and buried in the graveyard where the rest of his body was interred. Again, I'll not spoil that story. If you don't know of it, do check out uh, Runke's leg. Uh, and in terms of people having skills that go way, way beyond what we might think of in terms of information that you might get from super -sci, just through telepathy or clairvoyance, we have Pearl Curran, um, who presented his patient's worth and was very prodigious in producing lots of uh, literature, poems and novels and so on, uh, prodigiously, um, that went way beyond the literary gifts of uh, Pearl Curran in life. So it's a particularly strong case because there's such a discrepancy, such a mismatch between the aptitudes of the person supposedly coming through and the medium themselves. And then Robert Swain Gifford, um, so this is, um, Gifford was a, a, a very um, prominent artist and uh, following his death, uh, somebody was overshadowed supposedly by Gifford and continued producing artworks, including paintings that later uh, matched up with sketches that the living Gifford had produced and were only in his studio uh, and they were still there after his death. Uh, so there seems to be a kind of a pattern or a project uh, with those. So again, I offer you those neutrally for you to make your own judgments as to whether you think they represent strong evidence of a communicating entity that's following its own desires and motivations. So what can we conclude from all of this? Well, there is a long history of testing physical and mental mediumship. We've identified a number of conventional mechanisms that we'd need to take into account in formal testing. Um, in those formal tests, the results have been mixed, but clearly much stronger for mental mediumship and they have been for physical mediumship in the 21st century. I think there is a need for more psychophysiological uh, research because this is something that's extremely difficult to simulate and also might tell us a little bit more about conducive conditions, how mediums might be most effective. Um, and we need also to better incorporate the sitter and discordant's needs in understanding our thinking about mediumship. I think for me, too much of the attention has been on the medium per se Instead of thinking of this as a triad, it's a relationship between three persons and all three of those need to be built into our uh, kind of speculations and our modelling. So thank you for your attention.
I'm very happy to take questions if we have time. Thank you. Thank you.